Good morning, friends. It's Saturday, and I'm back with Chapter 36 of my upcoming book, Campaign at Fort Sticks. Now it's time to grab a snack, dim the lights, and let me take you into the mists of time with a story I call Affirmation. Have you ever noticed that you do not realize how much some things are talked about in the news, on radio and television until you become aware of those things? Up to the point the subject comes into your awareness, you could almost swear to have not ever heard of it. Then one day, for whatever reason, you become aware of a subject, and it is as if you cannot stop hearing about it. It's everywhere. Well. I made a discovery one day, and to this day, I still hear about it most every day in some fashion. The day started off much like any other. I did my chores, feeding the birds and gathering eggs. It was early spring then, so I was also spending some time getting my garden ready to plant. This mainly consisted of digging up earth and turning it over with my shovel in preparation of making rows. As I worked, I suddenly became aware of the need to use the restroom, like right now. Going into the house, I closed the door and was sitting on the throne when I noticed something sticking out behind the toilet tank in the corner. I was not even looking behind me at the time and realized I must have noticed it as I lifted the lid. Either way, it caught my attention and I was curious. I reached back and pulled it out instead of reaching for the tissue. I got more than I was expecting. I knew my father had men's magazines in the house. I had seen him carrying them around a time or two, but never really paid much attention to where he put them. In fact, it had not even crossed my mind to see what was in them. One time when I saw my uncle tuck one behind the seat of his van, I paid it no mind. I guess I thought it was normal. Today. I discovered where they were hidden. As my arm swung the magazine around in front of me, the pages unfolded to show me the centerfold. If I ever had questions of what a grown woman looked like without clothing, I had none left now. Not only were there no clothes, but the lady on the page was making sure nothing was hidden as her hands showed me everything. My reaction to this was actually a little painful due to the close proximity of the toilet seat. There was a sudden loud knock on the door and my mother hollered, Are you about done in there? I was startled and jumped, which hurt more. I tried to get the pages folded back in place and quickly stuffed the magazine behind the toilet where I found it. Cleaning myself up quickly, I flushed, pulled up my pants as I moved to the sink to wash my hands. Being startled did not have quite the effect one would expect, and as I looked down, I knew I could not just leave the bathroom looking like this. I washed my hands for an extra long time until I finally felt I could open the door. When I stepped out, my mother rushed in past me and I made tracks out of there. Sitting in Fort Sticks, I was a bit sore and checked to see what had happened. Nothing but a little red skin where the toilet seat rubbed. I breathed a sigh of relief and tried to relax when I looked out the window, in time to see my mother carrying something to the burn barrel. After she went inside, I went to see what it was, and found the magazine there. Had I not hidden it like it was? For the longest time after that day, whenever I heard anything to do with sex, nudity, or men's magazines on the radio or television, I would cringe and expect to be interrogated by my mother. As chance would have it, those subjects were in the media a lot because it was around that time that a major publisher of men's magazines was shot while doing battle in court over his publications. I guess it should come as no surprise that such subjects had begun to catch my attention. I was, after all, only a few months from being 12 years old and beginning to feel the raging hormones of puberty. My friend Tommy was also interested in these things, and sometimes we would look up taboo topics in the library or even the encyclopedia in our classroom. It was surprising how much information was actually in an encyclopedia. 
During the reading and writing portion of class one day, Tommy and I were standing by the windows in the back of the classroom reading an encyclopedia. We had it laid up on the windowsill, tilted so it balanced on the heat register. Anybody who cared could walk up behind and see what we were reading, but we thought nothing of it. Until the teacher called my name out loud. As I turned to see what the teacher wanted, Tommy scrambled to close the pages and hide the book, since instead of looking up subjects pertaining to our reports, we were looking up things about sex and the human body. The teacher frowned as he saw Tommy's annex and called me to the front of the room. Yes, sir, I said, standing in front of his desk. Kevin, some of the other students have said that you must be cheating in order to be so far ahead of everyone else on the reading charts. I looked over at the chart on the wall. My first line was full of stars, and I was well into a second line. There were some others in the class who were nearly done with a single line, but most, like Wayne, had hardly any at all. I was the only kid in this class who could take a mystery book home one afternoon from school and return the next day with a complete and accurate book report, despite having added a few scratches from falling out of a tree or other evidence that I had not spent the entire previous evening reading and writing that report. How could I cheat to read a book? I asked. That is a good question, he said quietly, but I do have to address the issue since it was brought up. Is there anything you'd like to share before we begin? I shook my head and waited to see what we were about to begin. I was going to be interviewed about my latest book report. Since the teacher had not read the entire book, he had to rely on the synopsis on the back of the book as well as reading from a few random pages within. To each question he asked, I was able to give an informative answer that was confirmed by the teacher as he read aloud from the book to the class to demonstrate what I said. Therefore, after a long and detailed inquisition, I was vindicated. Walking back to my seat with a smug look on my face, I noticed that Wayne was not smiling, but did not care. Had he been the one to complain? For the remainder of the afternoon, Wayne continued to glare at me. I was beginning to believe it was him who made the accusations against my reading. The question was, why? What would he have to gain if I had fallen from grace? It would add no more stars to his lines on the reading board. It would simply mean that I would be stripped of mine. Was it a simply a case of misery likes company? Tommy had arranged for his mom to pick him up from my house later that afternoon. He was going to ride the bus home with me and hang out for a couple hours. As we were leaving the classroom, Tommy spoke up. Man, you really put Wayne in his place today, Tommy said, grinning. He really thought you were going to get busted. What do you mean? I asked. The reading board, Tommy said. I heard Wayne and a couple of the guys that hang around with him telling the teacher you cheated and did not really read the books. Tommy confirmed my suspicions. This explained why Wayne was so irritated all afternoon. As we walked toward the front of the school, I was busy watching for Wayne. Unlike my clueless friend, I knew another defeat from me would not be allowed to pass without an attempt at punishment. Okay, look, Tommy, I began. Wayne tries to catch me after school. When he makes me miss the bus, I have to evade him and his boys until I get to the safe zone where he will not follow. Really? Tommy asked. He chases you? Yeah, him and the others, I confirmed. So listen, we're not going to be able to take the bus. Wayne is already out front waiting for me. We need to ditch out the side door of the school and take a shortcut through the woods to the next street. Why not just tell the principal? Tommy asked. Because then I would be a snitch, I stated, and I'm not a snitch. I can handle my own problems. Tommy grinned. You sure handled Wayne today. Which is why we need to get moving, I pulled him toward the door. If you see me start running, just walk normal. I don't think they will bother you if they're after me. Just get to the road through the trees and take a right. I will come back and meet up with you after I lose them. We left through the side door and were almost to the woods when I heard Wayne shout. 
Looking back, I saw the chase was on. I'll catch up with you in a bit, I said to Tommy, and headed off at a trot through the trees. I waited on the opposite side of the street until I was sure Wayne and his boys saw me, and then turned left to head up toward the highway. Normally, I would go right, but since Tommy would be going that way to meet up with me, I needed to lead Wayne off in the opposite direction. I kept running up the street until I had about a two-block lead, and then ducked into a side street to the left. I had explored this neighborhood the previous summer when looking for side jobs, and knew there was an alley up ahead that cut back to the street I started on. Looking back as I approached the alley, I could not see Wayne or his friends. I ducked into the alley and moved quietly along the fence back toward where I came from. Within a couple minutes, I heard loud talking and saw Wayne and his boys heading the opposite direction from myself, up the street. There was no reason to suspect they would enter the alley, but as soon as they were out of earshot, I ran fast to get out of there. Within a few minutes, I caught up with Tommy and was sure Wayne was blocks away in the other direction. I cast a glance back as we took a shortcut through the woods, but there was no sign of Wayne or any of his friends. We exited the woods and crossed the street to enter my woods. As I stepped into the trees, I noticed Tommy was not beside me. I looked back, and he was still standing in the ditch. You can't go in there, Tommy said, scared. Why not? I asked. These are my woods. The witch, he said shakily. There is no witch, I said laughing. Come on, I promise no one will bother you here. Wayne and his boys will not even come into these woods. Tommy walked up close to me and stayed right with me as we entered the woods. He told me about the old witch that scares people and chases after them with a large meat cleaver. The more he talked, the more I was sure he was talking about Gracie. I knew I could let him in on my secret and steered us toward Gracie's cabin. Tommy, the lady you're talking about is not a witch, I said confidently. Well, she might be, but she's a good person. Her name is Gracie, and she used to live out here in the woods by herself. My dad and grandpa used to bring her moonshine and stuff. We stepped into the clearing by Gracie's cabin. The place was run down and overgrown, but there was definitely still a cabin here. I pointed to it. See, this is Gracie's cabin. It's fallen to ruins since she passed on, but every once in a while, she still comes around to help those in need, I smiled. You're not afraid she will come back? He asked. Actually, I kind of hope she does, I said. She's a nice lady and I like talking to her. I only got to see her once when I was turned around and she showed me the way home after we talked a while about gardening. Tommy seemed to relax a bit. Well, the stories I was told is that she chases people with a meat cleaver and tells them to stay out of her woods. She also tells them if they don't quit being mean, she will find them. Now see, that I believe, I said with a grin. She's a tough old lady and would make you mind your manners. We both laughed and headed down the trail toward my house. When we got to Fort Sticks, I climbed up and invited Tommy to come and see. Wow, you built this? he asked. Yep, at the end of last summer after my dad burned down my fort in the field over there, I said. Why did he burn down your fort? he asked. It was an accident, I paused. I covered it with brush to camouflage it and he thought it was just a brush pile. Mom wanted the weeds gone, so he burned them. I reached down and picked up the edge of the table we sat at as I reached to take something from underneath. I laid it on the table and watched as Tommy's eyes got big. Is that what I think it is? he asked. Unless you think it's a library book, then yeah. We opened the book and perused through the pages quickly, pausing only at the centerfold. I could see Tommy starting to turn red and close the magazine. I quickly tucked it back under the table where Mark would not be able to find it, and could be reasonably sure no one else would either. My mom found out where my dad hid it, and she threw it in the burn barrel. I rescued it from there, I said grinning and sat back against the wall. Man, I never seen that before, Tommy said. Me either, until I saw this one in the bathroom. Tommy looked around for a minute as if trying to forget what we were looking at and changed the subject. 
So how do you write book reports so fast? Tommy asked. I mean, you have more stars than anyone in our grade, and everyone talks about it. Other classes talk about our board? I asked. Yeah, there's no one in any other class that has a second row like you do, he said as a matter of fact. Come on, I said, heading out of the fort. I have to change clothes so Mom will not yell, and I'll show you. We left the fort and headed into the house. Tommy looked around my front porch room while I was changing clothes. He paused, looking at the three jars of marbles sitting on the cabinet. Wow, you really have the jars of legend, he said. What do you mean? I asked, curious. In school, the guys say that you have giant jars of marbles that you won from earlier in the school year when you guys used to play marbles, Tommy paused. Even the lower grades talk about it. I had never told anyone I had jars of marbles. The only other person that knew was Mark. Was he telling people about them? What else was he telling them? I grabbed the latest book from my book bag and laid it on the desk with a piece of paper. Tommy came over and looked at it. Okay, I got this book today, I said. Now, I read the synopsis on the back and that tells me what the story's about. Then I read a couple pages from each chapter to learn the character names and some details about the story. When I'm done, I write a quick book report. I read the synopsis and then skimmed through the first two to three pages of each chapter quickly until I was confident I could summarize the book. When I was done, I wrote it up and handed it to Tommy. Tommy read the report, then he picked up the book. He read the synopsis and then a few pages before looking at me amazed. Wow, it really works, he exclaimed. I wish I had thought of that. Well, now you know, I said smiling. I bet you're going to start to catch up with me now on the board. I don't know about that, but I will do better for sure, Tommy said. We heard a car horn honk twice, and looking out the window, I saw Tommy's mom had arrived. I walked him out the front door to his mother's car and watched them drive off. It was the first time I had a friend actually come over to the house since I lived there, and I hoped it would happen more often. I hope you enjoyed this look into the campaign at Fort Styx. That's all for now, but I'll be back again next week with another story just for you. Until then, sleep well.